Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Director Watch, an awards watch podcast that attempts to get inside the minds of cinema's greatest auteurs, explore what drives them, and we also go on a few unrelated tangents along the way. I'm Ryan McQuaid, the executive editor here at Awards Watch, and joining me today is my co-host, Jay Ledbetter, like always. Like always, and today we've got a... Is this the big one for Haynes? Is this the one? I think so. Of the modern ones, it's for sure the big one, right? Certainly. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking Carol. We're continuing our, <sighs> our journey down the rabbit hole of Todd Haynes, and we're we're talking Carol. I'm I'm excited. This is... This is an important episode. We might we might have to be a little less unhinged than we were last ep. Maybe less discussion of Akon City this episode. I was I was thinking the words we in that sentence uh should not apply. It should be a the accusatory you. tone you have right now is is unbecoming. But I'll also be cor- but also correct. Well, you can be un- unbecoming and correct at the same time. Yes. And then I would be Robert Oppenheimer at that point, wouldn't I? Oh wow. Yeah. So way to timestamp this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Oppenheimer's endless. We live in his world. I don't know what you're talking about. It's yeah, you know, it's a tragedy that lives on. But what's not a tragedy, Jay, is we're not going to be alone in talking about Carol today. We are talking with uh, with a a favorite of mine. First time you've ever interacted with him, but he yeah. is a favorite here also at at, at Awards Watch. Uh, he is the host of and the runner up is he is the podcast extraordinaire when we look up to great podcasts we look to his show and that is the one and only mr kevin jacobson kevin welcome to director watch wow here i am flung out of space here to join you to talk carol so excited so wow. excited i'm excited you're here and i'm excited you're 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 on the show you've been listening to the show so far I have. Um, I'm one of your dozens and dozens of listeners. Oh, I would hope it's more than dozens. <laughs> that's, I hope that's, it's, that's you're overstating. You're, <laughs> okay. Jay. Well, which again, is the truth? <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we, I, Ryan's getting really sick of my uh, self-deprecating. Yeah, your self-deprecation uh, is uh, just, we got to be confident <laughs> early I, on. Otherwise, man. people are going to turn off. It's... Nothing is more confident than self-deprecation, in fact. Kevin, what do you mm. think? You have the most successful awards podcast out there. What do you think? I don't know if that's true. I think you do. Okay. Well, that's very nice of you. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, everybody lo- <laughs> everybody loves coming on Kevin's show. You just got time stamping this. Every- well, I mean, let's they ain't coming. Who's, they ain't- who, who, who's your least favorite guest? Yeah, Here come on. The <laughs> come on, let's go. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I, I very much, as the person who is so not into awards that we have a segment where I have to guess what awards a movie was nominated for uh i do like kevin's podcast very much so yeah uh, highly highly recommend yeah Jeez. that's a thank that's you so much the biggest ringing endorsement probably more than anything you're going to get on itunes wouldn't you say well, it is yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's not universal praise on itunes so no just saying <laughs> <laughs> it's never no it never is for anyone and don't read those comments because oh boy they can yeah, they can turn okay. a sunny day into like you got dementors outside. Good Lord. Um, but mm-hmm. we're here to talk about Carol. We're here to talk about Todd Haynes's follow up time. Not there. We're here to talk about a movie. That was released in 2015. Um, based off the Patricia Heisman novel, The Price of Salt. Stars Cape Blanchett, Rooney Mara, Sarah Paulson, Jack Lacey. Kyle Chandler, and I'm really excited to have Kevin on to talk about this one. Kevin, you specifically chose Carol when we put out the call when we were doing this because this is a a movie about an aspiring photographer who develops an intimate relationship with an older woman in 1950s New York. And so, Kevin, when I ask Mm. you what I asked Eric and when I asked Sophia, our previous guests, what do you like about Todd Haynes, what what makes him a director that you go back to his films? And you know, hmm. what about him as a director that you're drawn to? And uh, why did you choose Carol to come on the show for your first appearance? But what about this movie? Do you like potentially so much? Hmm. I mean, you potentially. I mean, you never know. Somebody might pick one one day a movie they don't like. But I kind of figure you do like this movie. That has happened on my show, by the way, and it oh, has really? thrown me off. 
but oh. yeah oh yeah anyway do you know um, about that going in ahead of time or or did you nope. okay nope <laughs> did it make for good shows that's a whole other story that's i think tough, so that's okay. a tough situation yeah it is tough good yeah. you know back and forth on it but anyway okay. yes Todd Haynes, I love him. I can't say I've seen every single one of his films. Like, I actually still haven't seen Dark Waters. Um, I don't know why. It just still hasn't happened. But um, his style, you know, his sensibility, just his interests. Um, I There's just an attention to detail and just an authenticity, I think, in his storytelling that I just really respond to, especially his stories about women. Um, I think he's just one of those guys sort of like in old Hollywood, like there was George Cukor where he's like one of those rare men working in Hollywood who has such a strong sort of uh, grasp, I guess on women and women's inner lives and just like sees the value in showing those lives on screen, like front and center in his movies. Um, I know he also has his music interests too, which are interesting, I think, in their own right. But for me, it's like this and Far From Heaven and Safe that really kind of speak to me more, more from his filmography. Um, and I think he's just a really great uh, actor's director, you know, and also is so like immersive with his style and just going all in, depending on whatever the film that he's making is that... I don't know. I just find that pretty much all of his films are an experience, um, no matter what you think of them. And and this one, especially. Um, so, yeah, for for me, like with this movie, this is one of those where like the anticipation was at such a high level for me in 2015 after like a full year where it first premiered at Cannes and I wasn't able to see it until like December. So that was a very long wait. Um I do think there was a chance that I was going to be disappointed because of how much hype I put on this movie, just like reading all these rave reviews and like watching the trailer so many times. I even remember looking up like the instrumental track from the trailer just to like listen to it on my own. It was like it was like it was, a drug. You it was wild. It, it really yeah. was. It it made it it was like my personality in 2015. Um and yeah, just getting hyped with all the Oscar buzz and everything. And yeah, for me, it was the rare experience where it actually did live up to all those expectations and sort of in ways that I, I expected. Like I knew the story. I actually had read the novel, as you might expect, <laughs> leading up to seeing the movie. Um, but I was also so blown away just from the cinematography and I think it's just like some of the best I've seen in a modern film, like that super 16 millimeter camera that Ed Lockman uses is just creates so many uh, incredible compositions and the color scheme. It's just so unlike anything that comes out nowadays. I find that it, if it, it felt like really a time capsule of the fifties, um, and it felt like those kinds of like Douglas Sirk melodramas, sort of like Far From Heaven, you know, and um, also like the women's pictures that like people like Joan Crawford and Betty Davis would make. So like all of this is things that very greatly appealed to me. Um, and ultimately, I, I feel like I just love how Todd Haynes just really seems to have this understanding of just queer relationships and how these two women who are like soulmates ultimately would then have to navigate this very rigid world of the fifties, like post-war America where just like everyone is watching everyone else and just like openly judging people and how the film goes at such a deliberate pace, you know, but to, to like, they're eventually like consummating the relationship in a way that felt very true to life. And I think the two of them, Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara are create the perfect chemistry together. And I just love so many aspects of this movie. And I'm going to stop talking now because I could just keep going on and on and on about the many incredible details of this movie. And I'll let someone else speak. Honestly, it was, it was, I mean, Jade, let's call it shop. Kevin kind of nailed it. And we, so it's good. like, it's review, over. subscribe. Podcast. And, uh, yeah. Very quick. And, uh, <laughs> 
no, <gasps> Kevin. No, Kevin. That's great. That's great. We love. I love the passion already coming out of you, Carol. Um, Carol. That's how I feel about this movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jay. I actually don't. I don't know your thoughts on Carol. I don't. You, this isn't a first time watch for you, is it? It's not. No, it is not. Watch. I saw this when it came out. Oh, okay. All right. And I just... it's terrible. <laughs> More like it was coming. Terrible. Oh, no. Jay. Should I go? Yeah. Should we just leave? (laughs) If you're going to be like this. See, he did this last episode. He he started off like that. And then he and then he talked why he liked it. So do you like it? I do this. I I need to abandon this bit. (laughs) Yeah, this is a this is becoming a recurring bit of see this. What happens when you're all negative the whole time? Don't listen to the show. Dad's bad. See, you get sucked into it. I need to bring some positivity and I will bring some positivity because this movie is, is pretty fantastic. It is. I I think it is the perfect marriage of two performers in these particular roles. Rooney Mara is the, the most unknowable actress ever. She is such a vessel for the viewer. And that is exactly what you need from her uh, in, in this role. And Kate Blanchett, I think is, she exudes so much confidence at, at all times. She just can't help it. And even in her times of intense insecurity in this film, there is this idea and it kind of comes to light at the end of the film that she is has, has an intense understanding of who she is as a person and wants to realize her true self. And, and you feel that in, in every moment of this film. And it's such a gorgeous, gorgeous movie. So precise, so elegant in ways that I would say none of Haynes's films to date have been quite this technically precise. I mean, it is it is so beautiful. There's that wonderful grain to it. And the, the, the costuming and, and the period specificity is uh, awesome. But also there is this sense of modernity to a certain extent with this film as well. There, It feels like a movie that was made in the 2010s, even if it is about this bygone era. You know, we're, we're grounding it in this idea that America, to a certain extent, has progressed beyond certainly what we see in, in this film. And the plotting is similar to that of uh, his previous film far far from heaven um but it it sort of expands on those ideas and also fully feminizes those ideas as well whereas far from heaven certainly has a a, a feminist bent to it but this is so directly and specifically about women to the extent that is there is there really a fully realized male character in this movie at all i mean kyle chandler is secondary to the story and and it's on it's honestly refreshing to see that perspective it's it's so rare to see that look we're again ryan already time stamped this podcast we're in the middle of of oppenheimer yeah oppenheimer gate uh as as far as female representation is concerned that's Um, one of the things that created oppenheimer gate i guess or barbie gate you know however you want to look at it but to see a film that is so deliberately focused on the, on the female perspective, I think is very refreshing because it's just not something you see very often. You see plenty of films where, where the female characters are given the short shrift, but this is not an accident. It, it is extremely purposeful and it is so much about these two women and their experiences and the experiences of people during this time. Uh, it's, it's a pretty beautiful film in so many ways with, with such intense moments of pontification and, and understanding and, and one of the great finales, I think of recent years. And I'll tell you what, Mm -hmm. it's bookended in almost the exact same way that past lives is bookended, which is interesting. Uh, that was something that 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 kind of sprang Mm -hmm. to mind. Um, but but it's a it's a great film. I I really really love it. Yeah, it's all right. No, see, I did I did exactly you did what the you same did. Same thing. You I know. My bit. I know. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's a, ba- it's a bad bit. And you're still stealing. <laughs> it is. It's a very bad bit. I I love this movie, and it 
it was actually this this rewatch for this podcast was the first time I'd seen it since 2015. And I and I couldn't actually believe that it had taken me that long to rewatch it because it's got everything you kind of want it in a movie that I kind of gravitate towards, which is you have these immaculate performances in the that are being that are in the hands of a director that's at the height of their powers continuously more and more confident as the years and times go on. I mean, this eight years in between I'm not there and, and, and this film and yeah, you got Mildred Pierce in there to be fair. Yeah, he did have Mildred Pierce. That's, that's fair. But in terms of, you know, but uh, you know, a mini series can flesh out a lot more than, than something like a film. They're very different. And, you know, I, I think that it would just reminds me of the, when we talked about it on the other show for far from heaven, the graduation of a director from safe and velvet gold mine to the very realized far from heaven. And then even, and for, at least for me, even like us taking that maturity and giving you just a great focus, even though it is chaotic film and i and i'm not there and then you yes he is doing uh mildred pierce in between these two um really great miniseries if i might add um but um jay you haven't seen it right i'm in the middle of it right now you're in the middle of it right now kevin you mm-hmm. you've seen it obviously. i saw it when it first aired yes. yeah yeah i haven't seen it great since kate winslet performance great kate winslet evan rachel wood mm-hmm. too right one yeah. of her best ever yeah guy pierce just guy Pearson, anything, yeah. honestly, to be fair. Uh, but I, 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 I remember when I was, I remember the same thing you kept uh, as you, Kevin, it was anticipation for this film. Uh, all the reviews were, were outstanding. I mean, Rooney won the best actress at camp. So like, this was, this was like the thing, you know? And I just remember seeing it. And I, you kind of just get put under a spell. That's the real thing. And like this movie is, is, is a, is a trance. You, you really just feel like you're, you're from the moment they lock eyes at that toy store in that department. Like it's, it's over. It's done. Like this movie is, this movie's got it. You know, it understands Mm -hmm. even just from the, from the opening that then turns, you get back to that at the end and, and the bookends, but even from that, opening shot of just you know they're quiet in this the you know it's it's guys running around you know and he sees these two women and they're sitting there at the table and it's it's just Rooney Mara's face she just has this 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 face on, on a camera that is it's it tells you so much about a character than any lines of dialogue could ever do like dragon tattoo she has that I thought she has that even in like a very talky film, like women talking last year in a movie like this, like she just, she, she's just able to convey so much in silence and just with her eyes. And yeah, I think it's the exact opposite. I think she is such a brilliant really? blank slate. Yes. That that's kind of her superpower. And it's not, that's not always the case. I don't think dragon tattoo. I don't think that's the case, but I think she's such a versatile actor and i think in this film she's as much a vessel uh in my opinion as anything else i mean th- i think she is it's certainly up for uh, interpretation but yeah no i think, I think I you just... can project meaning onto what she's doing totally yeah from your yeah. from the audience's point of view exactly yeah. but i and i mean blanchett we had this conversation at the first i think it was the first episode um jay where we were talking about like who's the greatest living actress of the last 30 years right mm-hmm Yes, and, that was the debate. And you and you said you think it's Julianne Moore, and I would like to present uh, Kate Blanchett, uh, who I, I said mean, on that like, show. She's at like tw- she's <laughs> yeah, at their 20. argument. I mean, I guess the 20, 20, 25. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a very fair argument. It, it's I mean, either way, she's probably been in a Todd Haynes film. So yeah, <laughs> good good for Todd. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. If only you know, ooh, Todd Haynes with like Francis McDormand, that would be very. Interesting, because Francis McDormand, I would argue, is right there with them and stuff. Or Kate um, Winslet. Or Kate Winslet, yeah. There. Mm-hmm. Kate Winslet's you know, there. He knows how to pick his ladies. He does. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. And then and I think of like... Rudy or the K- ladies are there already yeah. in the I case mean, of this yeah. film. <laughs> I mean, um, but 
I just I I think that Kate Blanchett's performance in this, like her, most of her performances, are, is just incredible, and it's so, you know, I think if it, this is in the hands of anybody else, this becomes such a trying to find the right words to say what this movie would be because it it just wouldn't work and it would lean too much into the sex lean too much into the scandal there's real it, it this instead it is it is establishing early on that that look means that when you lock eyes they're in love and there's something different because um, I love Sarah Paulson in this movie too. I think she's incredible. But there's that conversations that they're having between her and Carol of like what this girl means to her, what you know, what Rudy Mar means to her, you know, and 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 they're she's kind of fighting it early on to kind of say that this is different than even their relationship, right? And because she knows that this this deep down she's got to figure out that this is kind of it. This is going to be the one. You know what I mean? even though she's got this complicated marriage and she's got a child and, and she's going through this divorce and all this different stuff. And she has to fight all those urges to, to keep the life she has yet, you know, she's with Rooney and she's really finding out who she really is. And I find, I find that tug and pull to be so fascinating. I find the, you know, the way the the ending of this movie the last 35 minutes of this movie is perfect it's perfect because it delves into questions that i don't think many directors you know would even touch most male directors would not have its character confronted with these harsh decisions about uh, especially at the time about what carol has to face with this divorce proceedings, who she really wants to be. And I think that it's all handled from a very realistic and honest and brilliant perspective from, from, from Todd Haynes. And yes, Lockman's work here is insane. This is the best work that he's done so far. It is the most gorgeous movie. The costumes are out of control. I mean, it, it, from every single just technical point it is perfect it is it it it, i yeah it's kind of leaves you speechless when you're watching it because you're like Mm -hmm. how the how are they getting away with this and it also kind of bleeds in a lot of the the period pieces from you know from far from heaven and 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 even mildred pierce and it feels like he's building up it's, to it, this, this is much more technically no. accomplished i think yeah than no they are no, no 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 it is for yeah. sure but it just feels like again we're seeing a gradual climb mm-hmm. you get yeah, to this definitely. point and it's the culmination of all these things that he's been working on and and it just he delivers on all cylinders this is a yeah this movie's great yeah i also mm-hmm. think just to build off your point that there are gay stories that hollywood does that are told by other filmmakers that usually have a tragic ending or make you feel as an audience member, like this level of shame that the characters could feel. Um, But I think Todd Haynes and also Phyllis Nas, the screenwriter uh, are really, they're able to give you the high stakes emotions of this relationship um, while also giving you this completely earned, I think happy ending that, doesn't feel false in any way. And I do think that Todd Haynes being a gay director and Phyllis Nas being lesbian, lesbian writer, writer, you yeah. know, both of them are are so, I assume, very well attuned to how stories about gay characters often would play out, um, you know, prior to when this was released. And I think they they just know instinctively that it doesn't have to end in tragedy to give it a sense of meaning or importance that it can just be a kind of yes triumph that may be kind of bittersweet because of all the hardship that they had to go through to get together but it's just so moving you know also, and it, also too and i didn't mention this either no one's mentioned it but carter burwell score in this yep. as much it as has it, that one theme that that just gets just tweaked, tweaked and tweaked and tweaked and it's kind of brilliant 
it's mm-hmm. it's br- brilliant because it feels like feels like it's like kind of the connection point between the two of them in the relationship like music you know th- th- that feels almost like the third party this of this omnipresent relationship. strand yeah. connecting yeah. the two of them uh mm-hmm. f- for sure and it is kevin kevin brought it up uh, a little bit when he was speaking just a second ago but it's so refreshing to see a film using a, a, about this subject that is not proud of itself completely devoid of any kind of vanity and just yeah. simply trying to reflect a reality right and it is a it's a very dreamlike reality to be sure and it's so there's there's a comfort that you have when you watch this movie just because of how again it's kind of dreamy and you feel like you're kind of floating along with the film but when you kind of reflect on on a, what these characters are really going through it it can be heartbreaking and there is the are there are these just a couple moments of intense romance uh physicality between the two of them that are made so much more impactful because they are so rare you know it's not going for any pure titillation it's it's really trying to reflect a sense of of love and and adoration and and romance that is so much more honest than so so many of the movies that you see like this and and that's really refreshing and something i loved as yeah because well. because like a movie that you know they're both can titles and one's very modern controversy the other one this is just i think the, the the way to do it obviously is like something like blue is the warmest color which is a movie that has been so controversial and has been just taken apart by this by the, all these forces from the outside of it right and mm-hmm. and and you've had all the actresses complain about it you've had the directors complain about everything you know the, the director complaints and that celebrated film is so kind of it's it's just a very when you look at it even as groundbreaking as it was at the time it feels so it feels so of a piece of exactly what we're talking about which is this this using a lesbian love story, a gay love story or a love story in general for titillation and, and only for bodies rather than for a meditation on the soul and love. And I think like the sex scenes in this, the sex scene in this film is the most uninteresting part about this movie. I do. I think it's, it's shot very well, but like for me, I don't, it's like not even memorable for me. I don't even think about it at times. I think that that's kind of the point when you have this great writer and this great director who understand that like most audiences are expected to want to see that. But if you build up the relationship, then that part's kind of like not even that interesting. I think it is so intensely sensual. I mean, it is to me, yeah. it is almost overwhelming in the the, the physicality and, and the sense of uh, love between these two people. It's it's transcendently uh, romantic in many ways. Yeah. I also think it feel leering or titillating, no, like you no. said, you know, it, it's it just, just these two people. Yeah, it's just these two it. people that you're like, yep, they're in love. You can you mm-hmm. just buy it and it goes through those two committed performances. I mean, mm-hmm. I just, yeah, and I just love all the the, I love the production design, everything from, um, you know, just the the from the beginning where she works, where Rennie Mara works, and just and seeing this this store and the and to hear the train set and to see the hats and then you that coat that Cape that gorgeous has, coat, oh, my, oh god. my god, that's a gorgeous coat. But then her 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 suits are so. Or it, it just feels someone that's so tight and closed in, right? Because she has to keep it all inside her real feelings, her real emotions, who she really is. Everything is, is very much that, but she is, she is m- much more than what society or what hard her husband is trying to cage her in. And uh, I, I, I think that those scenes where she is fighting essentially his urge to want her back to want her as not even as his wife, but as his possession, it almost feels like, 
I, I, I think that those scenes of her being truly devastating, having to compromise to go to this, these dinners or to go to these Sunday lunches and her extreme just relationship and attachment to her daughter, because that's the only thing outside of this that is not hypocritical and is, is the only thing that's left innocent within her life, potentially outside of this new relationship that they bought. And I've just, you kind of, you just, I watched this film and I just thought about how vulnerable she is and how much vulnerable she is to Rooney Mara throughout the, and how, these two vulnerable people found each other and it and sparks fly, you know, mm-hmm. and, and they kind of, they need each other more than just, than just a fling. And, you know, yeah. if we're, if we're kind of talking about the kind of thesis statement of, of this podcast, trying to discover what drives a, a filmmaker, I'm realizing more and more that, that Todd Haynes is so focused on identity. Mm-hmm. And discovering your identity and, and morphing your identity. And in this film, it's it's Rooney Mara's character who is trying to figure out who she is as a person. Because there is an expectation and then there is her reality and, and her impulses and, and what feels true and real to her. And she's discovering that in the same way that the audience is discovering that for her. And that's what I mean when I say that she is she's very much the the audience surrogate in that regard. You feel so fully for her because she doesn't really comprehend what she's feeling at certain moments in this movie. And that fully comes to a head at the end of the film where she seems to at least temporarily turn her back on Carol before that magnificent kind of ambiguous, but maybe not entirely ambiguous ending. And it is so many romance films, they just, they're almost, they end in tragedy. So like you think of Brief Encounter, where it's about, it ends with this intense sense of of longing uh, between the two main characters. And in this film, it's kind of the exact opposite, where there is this intense longing the entire time and these two people who feel like they can never be together And then maybe the end of the film, depending on how you interpret it, is a realization that they might be able to be together. Or you could also interpret it as maybe Carol's smile is a recognition that this will forever be kind of this cat and mouse game. I choose to think of it as as the former, as sort of a recognition that these are two people who will be inseparable um, throughout time. And uh, that that's that's such a wonderful reversal that Haynes does. I mean, he is such a subversive director in in so many ways, and and that is an example of that. Yeah, that's mm. that moment when they're when Carol says to her that she has room in her apartment, like there's room for her. It's just it just is like you. I don't know if I've watched a movie recently where I'm like, just say yes. Just say, like I was sitting there, like I literally said, just say yes, for for God's sakes, just say yes. It's, it's like, come on. And yes, then she goes to that party and, and, and then she comes back and then that music kind of swells up as she's looking for her in the restaurant, which is Jay, you hit it right on the head. Like, like almost brief encounter ask, you know, movies of that, like character. Oh yeah. Like, very reminiscent know, just, of, I mean, there are some direct shots pulled from brief encounter. Yeah. So. And but yeah, no, I also I also think it's really fascinating. Therese, right? This is what her t- character's name Therese. is. Right? Therese. God, Therese no, Bellavette. Yes. Um, I think you know what's what's so great about her is is that is like what you're mentioning, Jade. She's she is kind of this wandering soul looking for, you know, she she wants to be a photographer, but she's. She's kind of insecure about herself. Society says for her to, you know, most likely just end up with the Jack Lissy character, right? And or um, you know, and then she can she would essentially fall into the place in which Carol is at right now. And she doesn't want that. And she's she's never really attached to him, right? Like she kind of like they go and and it, 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 it's one of those like they're not really boyfriend and girlfriend, but you know, he thinks of it more 
as that and it's and it's a guy projecting his attachment onto her when she's not there fully um and i i find a lot of those scenes like at the bar when they're early on in the film where you know when they're out with with friends and and then of course there's little baby face john uh magaro in this yeah, yeah. Magaro, he, he somehow he lives. somehow looks 20 <laughs> Speaking years of past younger life, yeah does he does he yeah. look 20 years younger but also like still the same like from like even past lives like a little yeah. bit like he's he's kind of ageless but then mm-hmm. also too like when you know she goes and meets him at her office and it's sort of like this thing of like you know are they gonna is he making his advances on her but she doesn't want that the relationship then builds upon like it's not about that she wants to earn her position here if she this is where she wants to be and i just typical world wouldn't probably even do that like it, it like the movie to me as i was watching i was like this does feel completely like a fantasy because the world keeps telling her to go down the same road as carol and she is refusing to do that she's so strong she's such a strong character that she is refusing that at every step in turn even when the world is like you are not supposed to go on this trip with this woman like he literally tells her like you don't know her you you you've just had one lunch with her and you rang up a toy and you're like a like a train for her that's it that's all you know and she even knows at this point that she's seen harge and and carol go at it you know and and she's just in his reaction kyle chandler's reaction of like i'm sorry who are you how do you know my wife like that it's just and you feel like her just like close up as well and so for her to do this she's like i have to discover myself and so it really is also a coming of age story for her um as well as also a love story like I was thinking of Desert Hearts when I was watching this as well, too, another film as well, when it turns into almost like this road uh, road movie between the two of them, kind of discovering one oneself. I just think Mar like Mar is so brilliant here. And I and I think that like every now and then, every couple of years, we get a brilliant performance from her. And it's it's kind of it's kind of crazy to me how like it's not I feel like she kind of just goes back and forth. Like she comes back, she delivers a great performance. She knocks it out of the park. It's just says, all right, I'll see you in about four years. Uh, maybe, and I'll de- deliver another knockout one. Cause I thought that even last year with like women talking where she just kind of comes in there for me, at least stole the show, walks away. And then, you know, we'll see her in a couple of years. I think when she works, really, but it's when not. she really cares about the material, she yeah. clearly yeah. puts in the work and yeah. she does here. Yeah. yeah. And when girl with a dragon tattoo, which is, partly why she was cast in this you know um i was just gonna say uh, ryan mentioned something earlier about uh the sex scene being like one of the least interesting things for me it's any conversation that they have with a man (laughs) in the (laughs) film is just like the dialogue is so inane intentionally i think um and just like also from a visual standpoint i feel like there's a lot of framing like with distance and framing with like bars in between them and you're like seeing them at a distance from each other and it does create this effect where for me like i'm just not at all interested in their conversations that you know either women have with the men in their lives which i think is very intentional obviously in showing how that when they're with other people their minds are elsewhere also too like richard and hard are almost like what you were saying, Jade, they're almost really the same character because they just are getting angry. The fact that yeah. they are not in control of the situation. And so they compulsively do these stupid things like hard showing up at, at Abby's door in the middle of the night, wanting to find her, hiring a private investigator, all this, you know, all these, these things because they're not in control. And it's a real commentary on, on men and how they feel like they must they must when they see something that's different and they they can't understand then then it's immediately bad and then this means that you know therese is 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 essentially aloof and carol is a menace to her child or her daughter and 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 what they're doing is is you know 
completely, you know, it's, it's not within any act of what a decent person would do, but as we see, yeah, Yeah. it's, it's very immoral. And so therefore, Mm -hmm. but we're seeing it as like, no, this is like the great love story. (laughs) This is the truth. Yeah. This is the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's good. So, I mean, it, it, it is also a recognition that these men can operate irrationally, immorally without any true repercussions. Um, and and their ability to kind of act however they want makes them dull and boring. And it is the the the, the kind of secrecy and the forbidden nature of kind of their relationship that does make it that does give you that sense of yearning because it is this very natural thing that the world has decided is unnatural. And um, that's kind of the tragedy of, of the entire story. And, and the ending of the film, again, you can interpret it multiple ways, but, but kind of this recognition of, you know, this is who I am and I'm going to operate the way that the world tells me I should operate, that my, my soul tells me I should operate is this extraordinarily romantic uh, idea and, and a very powerful one especially in the context of what she has to give up in order to be her true self in that scene with the divorce divorce lawyers that is so compelling and and maybe the saddest part of the entire movie where she has to give up maybe the most important thing in her life because she is a certain type of person just inherently it's not something that she can control i mean it's very similar to some of the themes of of far from heaven although it interprets it in a in a bit of a different way because i mean todd haynes is this incredibly feminist filmmaker so the way that he depicts the characters in this film and the way he depicts dennis quaid in far from heaven is 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 certainly very different because there is a level of control that dennis quaid's character has in that film he can kind of hide things and get away with it in ways that the characters in this film cannot. Yeah. Well, I also think too, I mean, she's making the ultimate choice between the, her happiness versus what's right. I mean, she's, she loves her daughter more than anything, but she also sees the, the opportunities that she'll have. And if she, in essentially she's if she fights she doesn't there's no guarantee she's going to win and i think that what she says is like we're not we're not what is it we're not mean people we're, we're not ugly people we're not we're ugly, ugly people. people yeah and if we go to court it'll get ugly it. and we're it'll not get ugly people. Yeah. yeah yeah and and the only person who's going to lose in that situation is, is the child is their daughter yeah. Yeah. yeah and she's again the smartest person in the room even though doing the smart thing is also the most devastating thing, or at least the emo- most emotionally intelligent person. Yeah, in the room. exactly. And so she obviously is seeing the best foot forward for her daughter, because if she somehow did win, what would that life look like for that child? You know, in 1950, you know, mm-hmm. and it's so she's, she's seeing beyond just herself in that moment. And yeah, it's, it's a hell of a, and also there's no guarantee, right? That she's going to be with the woman she loves by the, by when she makes that decision. So it's an extremely vulnerable situation and extremely difficult one to make. And all it is, is sort of a, a hope by the end of it, that, that the love is still there. And then that's why, again, the last, like then the last like 15 minutes of the movie, it's like, you're on the edge of your seat more than any thriller in in the world because you're just like for the love of god please be together because what will it all mean and (laughs) and and also because haynes just sucks you in as a director and the screenplay sucks you in too at buying that these two people are soulmates and it's very rare that i think it happens that's why i think like something like that's why i think a lot of people have responded to something like past lives this year is that it's this through the subtlety you get the 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 ability to to carve your way into the souls of these people and understand who they are by nature and then by the end the decisions they make no matter how hard they are 
they feel just and right within the people that you're watching on screen. And yeah, I mean, his, the shot on Kyle Chandler's face when she walks out and he realizes in that moment too, what he's done. It's, it's also of like, yeah, I kind of won here, but I completely lost too. And I like that there's that little linger left on his face as she's talking, but I think also as the door closes too, and she leaves. And um, it's, it's again, the, just the framing of the, of, of his camera and Lachman's work with him. I mean, they're just, they're really, really in step here. It's, it's the control that they have is kind of insane. Who is the yeah. third most important character in this movie? It is it, uh, rarely Ab- has there been Abby. so intensely focused on two people. Well, I would think it's Abby. I, I think you're probably right. Sort yeah. of by default. <laughs> Honestly. By default, because she, I mean, you realize that this isn't the first time. But she's got 20 lines. And, and, uh, she's got like three scenes, three or four scenes. Yeah, that's crazy mm-hmm. for a third performer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but like it's you think about, about the two of them. Yeah. The thing about like a brief encounter, like how many? Who's the third person in that movie? There's nobody really in that one. You know, yeah. past lives. Margot is that, but like he's in what? Like no, it, past lives has I, I, mm-hmm. I think a definitive third. Uh, mm, it's it's really between those two for the most part of that movie. But you know, Uh-oh. but I think Abby's I think Abby's scenes are so critical i don't know kevin what you what you think of those scenes i think they're no i think sarah paulson is excellent here and just the chemistry she has with kate blanchett it's like they've known each other truly for years which is what's the dynamic is with this relationship where i don't know if it's directly stated that they had a relationship prior to this but at least heavily implied or at least that's how i've always understood it and now they're just friends and you know yeah, but like they discovered just... who they were kind of together at a young age. Sure. And you yeah. know, and that they had each other, but it it blossomed more into a friendship. Even though I kind of feel like Abby really kind of wanted it to be a little bit more more than Carol. Hundred you know? percent. Yeah. That's right? what I think too. And mm-hmm. so that's why when she's a little bit when Paulson's like a little bit hard on Mara in those open in those scenes, especially at the diner, like you know, she's like, Why are you being so mean? And he's like I've been here before. You need to keep going. You know what I mean? Because if you really do love her, you know, you can't just crumble here. But then also, too, like the scenes where she's just, she's going out on her own. She's learned from this. The You know, the the phone call calling her and she hangs up the, you know, the, the ability to find herself and her confidence. I think that those scenes are so important for, for Rooney as well in, in the movie. And mm-hmm. I mean, that that's the thing is, it's the, is she's, she's not the titular character, but she is a co-lead, if not the lead of this movie. And we really see, like you're saying, Jay, a lot of it through her eyes throughout mm-hmm. the, the entire film. I'd say it's so, largely her perspective, but Sarah, Sarah Paulson, a weird one. I really thought she was going to become the a one quasi movie star. I guess she's just been swallowed up by the Ryan Murphy verse. Is that is that what happened? She's indebted to Ryan Murphy, unfortunately. <laughs> she's made. I mean, she did like Run a few years ago. That horror movie. That yes, uh, exists. Oh, God, yes, it does. It does <laughs> exist. That is a pulpy, that? pulpy movie. What was, what was that one about? It's another Munchausen by proxy. Oh, movie. Yeah. okay. Another one. I, I, it was all yeah. the rage around. Feels it feels like there the... was a lot of that in yeah. that era, like okay. sharp objects and whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. sharp objects. That's a good show. Mm-hmm. What is it? Uh, run. All right. <laughs> Who directed that? I don't know. See, this is, this is, this is what we do. This is what we do here. See, but no, I, I agree with oh, you. Oh, it's felt... the, uh, it's the, the searching missing guy. Oh, okay. I, mm-hmm. I, I've need I've, seen missing I don't think I he directed searching, missing you know. but he directed searching which I yeah hate. she really is she really is sort of indebted to to murphy and i mean she's yeah. she was like nurse ratchet in the sure ratchet was. and mm-hmm. then she was also swimming in murphy money scrooge mcduck style just <laughs> living it up well she Good was with her. she was with caden uh, miss america that came out a couple of years ago about 
Yeah. And they were together in Ocean's 8, too. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. that was a good movie. She's good in that movie. Mm-hmm. I liked Ocean's 8. Kate Blanchett is so hot in that movie. They, just yeah. To, just unreal. Most movies. What? Yes. Yeah. I was going to say, she's. She, She's, she's hot here. here. Yeah, she's hot quicker. here. You know, she's hot. I mean, in, she's hot in Tar. She's hot in everything. Thor to Dark. Just... Or what is that? Thor Ragnarok. She's even hot in that. Mm. You know? <laughs> about the only good thing you could say about that movie. Um, but but yeah, That's no. Tangent. Yeah, that is another. Um, Do you guys anything else? I was just going to mention something that Phyllis Phyllis Nas said, um, which I found very interesting. Um, mm. She said the point of view for her is always with the more vulnerable party, which is something I didn't really pick up on because it always felt like pretty well balanced for me from the beginning. But I think it's an interesting choice because in the beginning it's with Therese very much. And then by the end, it becomes more about the divorce stuff with Carol and everything where she's in the more vulnerable position. And now Therese is like working at the New York times and she has more confidence now And then with Carol, it's like, you know, her almost feeling like a concept (laughs) in the beginning, Uh, but then eventually seeing that pain of her domestic life and how like they both become the object of affection at different points in the film. Mm -hmm. Like Carol is very much like the one that you are gazing at in the beginning. But then by the end, Carol is the one that's just like reaching out to Therese and being like, I love you and is like practically begging her to Mm -hmm. live with her. So I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting sort of perspective shift that I didn't really pick up on in my previous watches that it really does feel so Therese focused in the beginning. And then it does gradually shift over to Carol when she is in a more vulnerable spot. Yeah. It's almost like they switch roles, like what you're seeing there in that, in that moment. The focus is on the uncertainty in many ways. I'll say this, as far as a motif I love in the, in the movie vehicles, very important mm. in this movie yeah. and 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 especially you know people looking through the the windows of, of vehicles so it's just these people traveling through space right in in these Long things of, that they're not Long out of space yeah. Yeah. yes and, and then that usually they're not in control of and there's also right. that great opening shot great g-r-a-t-e of a great inside of a subway station, which at first is just aesthetically kind of beautiful. And then mm-hmm. you crane up and it just turns out to be this sewer grate outside of a train. Mm-hmm. And and so kind of that juxtaposition is already kind of putting you uh, on edge to, to one extent or another. I, I think it's just a great way to start that movie, especially when you look at it is so elegant, but it is such an inelegant thing that we're looking at. And um, I think that's just a a brilliant way to start the movie. Just this idea that, you know, through all of this um, surface level uh, beauty, there is also this underlying tension and and uncertainty that we're going to experience for uh, the next two hours. It's a a very intelligent movie, both from a structural standpoint, a technical standpoint, an emotional standpoint very mature in ways that I would say Haynes's films have not entirely been. There is a sense of certainly in something like safe, there's kind of this anger behind it, this angst bubbling throughout it. And even in a movie like, like far from heaven, I would say that's a more, uh, it's not entirely bitter, but it, it has a little more venom than something like this. This is just a purely empathetic exercise. Yeah, which um, I think is a, a a really cool lane that he found here, and then he gets venomous again with uh, Dark Waters. But we'll get there. <laughs> well, and also, yeah. I think this is in the context of Dark Waters and Wonderstruck. It almost feels to me like this is Haynes acknowledging this is kind of my definitive statement on the things that I've been so interested in for so long, and then he starts changing it up in in the same way that tree of life to me was Malik being like, okay, I said what I wanted to say about the universe. Now I'm just going to make weird movies about people going to concerts um, <laughs> and walking through clubs and completely and yeah. stylistically unique and, and uh, different um, modes. Uh, I, I feel like this is kind of an interesting inflection point 
for him because it is such a precise, wholly realized film. Yeah. Well, also is is really interesting is that like we say this and it's it's not his screenplay. He's not on it. He's not credited. This is like the first time we're talking about a film that he hasn't put his stamp on, at least on paper. Um, you know, and I think that 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 marriage between you know him focusing solely on the craft, right of 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 how he's interpreted the screenplay, and of course, obviously, you know, for everybody out there, directors still have a, a massive imprint on their screenplays, even if they didn't get the writing credit. Like they go in there and they do their whole thing, and you know, like Robert Altman's notorious for. Ne- like never putting his name to a screenplay, but yet just he's his imprint is everywhere in the dialogue and how that you know, he works with the characters and the improvisation and all that stuff. But for here, I think that is, it's such a maybe coming off of something like Mildred Pierce and writing all those. I, mean, I think he wrote all those, those, I want to say he wrote most of those screenplays there. I can look, I can double check myself here in a second, but to have that, um, to have that relationship of, you know, working off of somebody else's script and being able to mold that. I, I thought that that was, I think that's such an interesting move for him at this point of his career of, you know, not of, of facilitating other things to other people that he's working with. And then focusing, I think a lot of his attention with, with Lockman and then I think giving his, be- like Jay, you're saying his best directed film of the series so far because it just feels so definitive of everything from from the from everything that he's made so far the angstiness of of and the you know the chaotic nature of of i'm not there you have this you know these 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 queer stories that he's that he's tackled but not fully i would say invested into a romance just yet like he's he's talked about you know, like far from heaven, I would not say, at least in the particular when it comes to the the gay the gay storyline with Dennis Quaid is not a very romantic storyline. It is what breaks apart that family for sure. But it's but her relationship with uh with uh, with her gardener there that is that is the, the 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 romantic element of that film. And then of course Velvet Goldmine, just like it's that movie is just chaotic in what it's trying to do. It, you know, with in terms of love sex drugs rock and roll it's it's trying to be of that of the time and so it's it's it it does feel subtler and it does feel though more precise and it's just in what's so great about him is he's focusing on these characters and kevin you mentioned it being this director that just has the ability to grab these incredible female performances and write in in either write or at least direct these these such nuanced um characters that that these actresses want to come back and back and back even like julianne moore to do like <laughs> i'm not there she does like a bit part in that or whatnot um I, I i've i think it's i think it's just brilliant to see his evolution and, and you're right jay i think that this is like because the next two films i've already seen them um they feel like they're 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 starting a new era and that he's he's drifting away a little bit from the from i think a movie like safe and and far from heaven kind of tied together a little bit with this more than like i'm not there and velvet goldmine that weirdly enough feels like a movie that's kind of connected to wonderstruck a little bit with like needle drops and and new york and and and, and yeah, i've not seen you know, in wonderstruck and we'll talk about it but i do remember hearing I'm talking about that Wait, you're you just made care now. You're what is this? What what is <laughs> what is what is wonderstruck? This seems what? Excuse me, but we'll we'll talk about it. Yeah, it, we'll talk it, about it, that. It does seem like this is kind of a turning point in some ways. Yeah, no, for sure. But do you guys have any last thoughts on Carol? Have we? I mean, I will just say for me when go, I think you can of go Carol, for another forty five minutes if you want, Kevin. It's absolutely here. I okay. go. Here um, go. So. Time. I when I think of this movie, I think of the looks and the silences between the characters and just how they're framed. 
And I feel like it's just such a great example of how some stories, like even small scale dramas like this can work, not only as the novels, you know, that they're based on, but as a film, just with so much thought put into every single visual detail to just help it to come to life, essentially. Like I think of the letter that uh, Carol writes to Rez, where she says there are no accidents. And that is very much feels like the thesis for this entire production. So I, I I think you're right about like the looks, but then also like when she puts her hand on her, on her back as she's at the piano and then it's the same. We don't know. You know what I mean? Where Mm -hmm. it's, that's the, when she's leaving to go to the other restaurant after she's meeting up with her in the, in the final act. Totally. And you, and you see that in the beginning and it, it doesn't, it's just like a, a goodbye. You know what I mean? But then as the film goes on, that small gesture, that small touch, you know, that's just a pat on the back or just a, you know, a hand there, just normal. It, it speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. Yeah. I mean, just the way that they're, the way the cameras block when they're having that iconic lunch, you know, and mm-hmm. how it almost feels like Carol's up here a little bit. She's a little higher almost it feels like and 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 Rooney's you know a little bit lower but then also just to pose the blocking and the way that that the camera is pointed at Carol when she's with Abby at that that small bar later in the film and how everything is so tight in that shot because everything is a secret everything is very um closed between the two of these because it really feels like it in that moment like it 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 the secret cannot get out beyond these two walls. And these are the only people that they can trust really at this point. I mean, like Harge is always saying like to their daughter, you're seeing a lot of Aunt Abby right now. And it's because, well, Abby's the only one that understands. And so then you have, you know, I think the, you're, you know, Jay, you're talking about windows. I think it's like the, the shot of when they're at the diner and you almost see like Rudy's perspective out, is it like outside the window there when she's looking mm-hmm. out the road? Um, and it's, it's very dark and it's very, it's, it's very, these, it's these man-made barriers preventing yeah. themselves from being their true selves. It's yeah. a, a so brilliant, cool. so brilliant good. metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, but no, I just absolutely. Is this the definitive Patricia Highsmith film? Right. This has got to be right. Cause she's had so many of her novels adapted I, mean, I love the talented mr ripley but this one is for me that i at least revisit <laughs> again, Evan, again is this your favorite haynes film yes it is ryan very, is this your favorite of the haynes films that we've covered so far no what's your is it far from heaven no what is that i'm like? I, i'm 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 not there it's my favorite i, I love that oh, 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 oh yeah. of course yeah okay are you are, so you, kevin you're not a deep water fan I haven't seen it. He hasn't seen, seen it. Seen Dark Water. So it's called Dark Waters. Dark yeah, Water. No, Deep Water well, something different. <laughs> Deep Water is different. Remember, that's the Ben Affleck and an Armas movie. Remember that, Jay? That would be interesting to see directed by Todd Haynes, though. Hmm. Yeah, because be. that was um, that was Andrew Lyon. Sure Adrian was. Lyon? Adrian it sure Lyon. was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that movie was. I liked it. I thought it was. I thought it was silly. That's the silly stuff. Ben Affleck also, growing his snails. <laughs> Tracy Letts doing his thing. He Goddamn sure cell phone. Thing. You know, I love that. I, I actually can't wait to see what that there's supposed to be that television version of from Stevens Alien of the talented Mr. Ripley and the books that are going to be turned. Yeah. I think it's for AMC. Andrew mm-hmm. Scott playing Tom Ripley and Johnny mm-hmm. Flynn as is Dickie in, in, in that. Well, God bless Peak TV. Probably won't watch it. <laughs> no for sure but I, I i would say that it of of someone who's had a ton of her novels done this is i remember i just remember when this movie was the idea of it was being brought out and i just thought oh wow that's such a that's such an interesting film because it wasn't is it's right after when kate won her her second oscar right and so yeah this is her follow-up project and it's mm-hmm. What a great project to get behind. So yeah, it's a great, great movie. 
And with that, if we don't have anything else, anything else? No. Okay. Jay, you ready? I'm ready. Test, Let's get the test your going. award season knowledge based right. off uh, the film we just did, which is Carol. In a segment we like to call it's an honor to get nominated. Now, Jay, your luck. You're lucky. Theme to, song. You're, and we do need a theme song maybe for this. Uh, Jay, you're you're lucky today because this movie was nominated for Oscars. We're getting a little contemporary, so I, I have a semblance of an idea of on this one. Do you know how many it was nominated for? Well, let's run through the categories. Okay. Blanchett was nominated. Okay. And she got lead and Mara got supporting, correct? That is correct. And this was the Danish girl year? Sure was. Sure was. Good for mm-hmm. Alicia Wikander. Uh, okay. <laughs> she won That's for up. Ex Machina. <laughs> In our hearts. In our hearts. hearts. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to imagine this was nominated for adapted screenplay. That's correct. Now we get into the text. Costume design, absolutely. Yeah, that's Sandy Powell. She's like the yep. staple. Uh, she deserved that nomination. It's incredible work. See, I think the score is incredible, but I also know one of Carter Burwell's things is that he hasn't gotten the shine that he deserves. And now he gets it for his McDonough stuff. <laughs> I'm going to say it got nominated for score. That's correct. Anything else? I mean, cinematography is sitting right there, but I don't. What about production design? No, should mm, have been. I wish. Oh, that would have been good. We can break down that in a second. All right. I'm going. Uh, yeah, I'll say this was a big Oscar. I'm going to say it got cinematography. That is correct. It did. Lockman got in. And Lockman's I got. Guess, did it? Uh, was this? So this was 2015. So we were at nine. Or uh, uh, whatever the expanded best picture field. I bet this got a best picture. It did not. What? Famously, w- did not. W- Jay, would you like? To- Jay, you got all of them. You got six. That was all. Okay, yeah. so that was all. Of them. So I, I overshot, yeah. but I got all of them. Yes, but uh, yeah. so the winner of best picture, obviously. Um, you know what? I'm not going to do it today. We got Kevin. Do you mind reading down what? was nominated for best picture since you know you're okay the, sure the I've been reading down here. off the off the dome let's do it uh well should i start with the winner which is spotlight yeah spotlight spotlight spotlight, spotlight. Yeah. michael keaton there they knew uh, and they, they let, let it, it happen. happen yeah they did mm-hmm. they did now they did. um the big short was nominated mm-hmm. yep the start of adam mckay and his new era uh, bridge of Spies, Ooh, great movie. Got to cross that bridge. Yeah, you got to cross um, it. Brooklyn, good movie. Oh, this movie is so much better than Brooklyn. For no, like this a period. And, hang on, ugh, hang get on, out of here. hang on. <laughs> Mad Max, Whatever. Fury As, Road. Nah, yeah, okay. Yeah, fine. that's yeah, that's fair. The Martian, meh. <laughs> Silence. Um, much better the, than The Martian. The Revenant. This movie's so much better than The Revenant. <laughs> and Room. Room had no business being in there. Sorry. Just I think this, the hot I, take. I, I, I would say there the, was only, a the only movie I think is better is Mad Max. Um, A fair statement. I have to double check. I'm looking at my list right now. I don't know if that's true. And Maybe. if somebody says they like this better than Mad Max, no problem. I think I it would think be spot- it would be my winner. To be clear, Mad Max would be my one A. <laughs> I mean, I like Spotlight. Um, I was yeah, you know, an agreeable Best Picture winner. Yes, so, that is exactly what it is. I don't think it's. I think it's a little bit better than that. I don't. I just mean that everyone can agree that it's a good movie. Yeah, I don't think it's like. Well, I also think. Oh, actually, I think it's a great movie, but but. Yeah, some people think it's a great movie. Yeah, but I don't think it's like I don't think it's like people would say that it's bad. I I don't. Yeah, a few people wouldn't say it's bad, but like the the what I think Jay's trying to get at here is like the the best picture of it's fine, and so therefore you give it instead of you know 
It is agreeable is the agreeable the right is like, yeah, agreeable where it's where people are like, yeah, it's not a the lot best of people thing, will but, find you know. the bombast of Mad Max off putting mm-hmm. the cynicism of Birdman. Was this Birdman year? No, the, the, next the year? Revenant. No, it's a Revenant. The Revenant. Yeah, I'm, the Birdman I mean, was the year the Revenant before. Revenant is just not that good. Well, they, uh, they, you know, what's funny, the, the cynicism of Birdman worked for him because it won Best Picture. God, that's right. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. I think the yeah the, I think what you're meaning is like the cynicism of something like the Big Short, like you, that's a screenplay. We're not See, go... the Big Short is a movie that I think people pat themselves on the back for, for like, like wow, this is important. I think it's a good. I I, I like the Big. Short. I kind of like the Big Short too. But Kevin, you like the Big Short? The only one of his little three or four, however many of this modern era that I like from him. Do you wish he'd go back to comedies? Like. like Will Ferrell comedies? No, because Will Ferrell's washed. But yeah, but is he washed because at, he's not working with Adam McKay? They did. I don't think so. I just up. think he needs to. He can't get past his manchild persona, and now he's fifty-five. Yeah, but now Adam McKay thinks he's the most intellectually smart. Well, people are on the planet. Him. Yeah, he thinks he's Patty Chayefsky. The best thing that they've done in the last ten years is be executive producers on Succession. That's their oh. last collaboration together, if I'm I not mean, mistaken. That worked out pretty well. Yeah, mm-hmm. and because it doesn't have either one of their fingerprints all over it. It's completely Jesse Armstrong all the way. What is uh what's what's old McKay up to next? Oh God. What was he doing? He's doing like the was gonna, gonna do the Saranos, Saranos movie. Yeah. Is he still doing Jennifer that? Lawrence dropped out? But he's still no, he's, doing it? He's doing isn't so. he doing some Robert Pattinson movie? Average height, average build is what they have for him, right? Where it's like, what average. A, it's a good podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but bad blood. Okay, so average height, average book, Kings of America, some sort of mini series. He's got it's a average height, average build is a serial killer or a, a serial murderer hires a lobby a lobbyist to change the law so that he can commit murder. Um, more often the murderer attempts to stop a retired police officer from following his trial because he won't give up on killings the movie robert the Ca- downey amy adams robert pattinson <laughs> forrest whitaker daniel i, mean, I can't De- say i'm daniel not Detweiler. interested yeah that is know. so kevin that Everybody you remember when anticipated movie freaking adam k i didn't even know about it before today but now it's like so. shut up number one right? now i know that it exists wow that so <laughs> I I would put Carol in the. I would take out Room or um, I take out the Martian. The I Martian take out the Revenant. Yeah, I know you would. I know you. It's long standing. You don't like the Revenant. Right, <laughs> I mean, Kevin? I would. I would. I would take. I'm out, a famous Revenant hater. Yes. There's it's a lot the of movies. It's a miserable experience. It's the number two or three. Yeah. I, yeah. And it kind we, of pisses me off that Brooklyn was the movie of this ilk that got in over it. I think it's very telling that Brooklyn was and Carol wasn't. I'm just going to say that. But but Brooklyn's a Mm -hmm. good movie. Brooklyn's a good movie. It is a really good movie. I love Brooklyn, but I just think it's interesting demographic wise. Mm. Mm. Oh, oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. But they went with this. That very. It's a safer choice to go with. Yep. And a straighter choice. I always thought that year too, like room being the one that got director and a picture nomination. I always thought that that was like, I always thought that that was silly. Remember That's when Brie silly. Larson made real movies. Yeah. Now wild. she's, now she's just like cameoing in the fast and furious franchise and doing Marvel movies. I, get that I say, you know what? Let her do whatever she wants. It's fine. But guys do it all the time, you know? So at least she's getting paid. I just think she's talented and I want her to do real movies. Oh, she is really talented. <laughs> I wish I, yeah. But I just don't know, like a movie we could put her in, that would be like, like I don't. She couldn't do what Rooney does in this movie. She could have been uh, in the Furiosa prequel. Ooh, she. But again, that's another franchise. It's fine, but it's a auteurist franchise. That's fair because it is George Miller. But like, let her do some indies. You know, short term. I miss Andy Brie Larson. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Andy Brie Larson's best. The early twenty like, tens was the sweet spot. Well, we got the yeah. Marvels. Get we excited. Do have the Marvels. We do have that. Would so anybody want 
anybody talking about the fact that like for this movie todd haynes is just like compl- everybody got nominated except him well it didn't get picture which would imply that it probably wouldn't get director yeah but that's it's sad wouldn't you would you replace that well it should have it should have gotten picture okay yeah all right would you would you guys i mean in your ritu for the revenant get out of here are you kidding again (laughs) the the very next year they give it a back-to-back directors honestly that still shouldn't believe that i mean we all know that should be george miller like that's yes yeah that that's, makes sense. and that's... and let's be honest the direction of spotlight is not its greatest asset i would say it's better direction than room i think room the reason that's nominated is because he's directing a child oh that's part of it i do think that's part of it because that's Man. happened before Flounder you, himself yeah trombley just grown hasn't he he hit that growth spurt. He's like dunking basketballs mm-hmm. now. Well, in... when this came out, he was like he was 11. Like pocket, yeah, he was like so pocket size. Now he is grown. Yeah. Yeah. Now eight years later. Crazy it's how good. that happens. <laughs> eight years later, it's just. Um, would you guys would you guys give Kate the win? Over oh boy. Bree? Uh, over you... Bree? Yes. Okay. For me. Okay. Uh, I don't know if she would pretty... be my winner overall. It's oh, underwhelming! List. I don't want to say too much because I haven't. No, gotten there Kevin. On my yeah, Kevin's got. Show yet. Kevin's got to be. <laughs> he's got to play the audience up. He's got. I mean, Bree was epi- Bree an episode was to be named good. later. <laughs> yes, thank you. Bree was very good in Room. I would. This I, is I, this is one of those where I, I again I sit there and I go that could have been easily Sir Sharon and then we we could solve a lot of problems in this world. Looking at looking at that year now. Also, Charlotte Rampling's amazing in forty five years, regardless of her politics. I mean, obviously, of course, uh, Meryl Streep and Ricky and the Flash. <laughs> well, that's the um, year that that Juliette Binoche should have been nominated for Claus of Sils Maria, if I'm not mistaken. See, I never, I never know what year that movie was in the mix for. But... I'll tell you, the other person that should have been nominated is Nina Haas for for Phoenix incredible performance way better than well jennifer lawrence and joy mm. joy is the a weird that's the, a weird one you know, absolutely, you know who's throwing heat in that movie bradley cooper bradley cooper comes in and just sets that movie ablaze for like 10 minutes he's really good because yeah. bradley cooper's a pretty good actor i won't you know he's great as the elephant man. <laughs> not the have elephant you, man have you seen that no, Maybe. I just assume he's great. It's just a very funny thing that he was like, I'm, I'm the Alpha Man, but also I'm still hot Bradley Cooper. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, what about Rooney? Well, well, I mean, Kevin, I have to ask you. Should be in lead. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yes, she yes. yeah, she's more lead than Kate. Who would you kick out a lead in order to put her in there? Oh, Maybe. so would you flip? No, they're oh, co-leads. Okay. To okay. be clear. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's hey. There's a reason that we ask the questions. That can, and not yeah. Kate. Yeah. Selma and so. Louise style. Yes, exactly. And there hasn't been double Best Actress nominees from the same film since Selma and Louise. I will which say, is unfortunate. Yeah, it really is. That actually would have been the perfect time to do it. It would have been, and I think, is it a hot take to say she could have gotten in if she did campaign lead? Yeah, interesting. Over I mean, Jennifer Lawrence, I think. Well, that's probably so fifth. weird to think that it didn't get the love at the. It's like Joy's top, a solo nom. Right? Maybe it would have been like a yeah. great. Maybe that's, 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 that's Louise. wild. Yeah, interesting. Man. But then, yeah, and then that would have. I mean, huh. it was like Vikander was going to win that thing all all along, even though she shouldn't have. Also a lead. Also, yes. Also a lead. There's only well, lots of there's, interesting politics happening this year. Yeah, yeah, what about uh, uh, the, 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 the name of that film would imply that she is, in fact, the lead. But the, the Danish girl. God, what a movie yeah. that they thought who, they who were very, I? very brave. Don't make and don't. Well, Should have gotten know. nominated for more than it did. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Probably would have. I mean, give it adapted screenplay. Lockman's never won, right? Cinematography. So. He's never won. Because he's always worked with Haynes. He's been nominated like a ton. He's like a bridesmaid, never the never the bride. Yeah, I think it's just been far from heaven and Carol that he's been even nominated. So Yeah, because he didn't get nominated for I'm not there. 
in that incredibly yeah. stacked year like we talked about that's it it's, it's kind of wild to be honest with you because his work is so great and i know chivo's great and you know chivo's won like five oscars it feels like but that's that's a little much is there i mean i don't know if i would have given sandy powell even the oscar either because Mad Max Fury Road's costumes are so amazing. That is right? true. I did watch that Oscars and God, it was so fun to just see all those Australian maniacs up there. <laughs> yes. Jenny Bevan and her leather that was jacket. So awesome. Yeah. yeah. That was that was when Chris Rock hosted, right? Yeah, yeah I think so. You got okay. me on that one. Yes, Chris Rock hosted. And nothing happened to him that night. So yeah. Um, but yeah, I just remember that whole night. Like Mad Max Fury Road people just going up and there's it's just almost like it felt like Lord of the Rings where you like see all these people that are just like clearly Hollywood would never invite to this <laughs> unless yeah. it was for this all the, all the outcasts. Yeah, all the outcasts, but yet like a, a motorcycle gang. Yeah, it felt like yeah, and then <laughs> their leader the party. Yeah, and then their leader doesn't win anything. It felt like very yeah. It felt like Grand Budapest again, or like Grand Budapest one. Like it felt like all the your movie. Tech. Your movie is the best at everything except being a movie. Yeah, your movies. Your boss That's is the guy who brought it all together. Yeah, right? it's like everybody in your office is great, but your boss. Your, we your kind of C- like, your CEO. You know? Yeah, yeah you, you know, know. maybe next Ask. time. You know what I mean? So. All right. Well, Kevin Jacobson, we've come mm. to the end of the road. Yes, we have. So, Kevin, can you tell everybody where we can find all your amazing work on the Internet as well as your amazing podcasts? Yes. Well, thank you both for having me on. First of all, this was a wonderful excuse to rewatch Carol, which I will gladly take any day. Um, And you can find me on Twitter. I guess we're still calling it that. But I'm going to call it that. Yeah, we're going to call it that. Just yeah, at Kevin, Kevin underscore Jacobson. That's S E N, not S O N, as some people have assumed it was. And my podcast is at Oscar Runner Up on Twitter. And the podcast itself is and the runner up is, which is about old Academy Awards races. And right now we are focusing on Best Actress, which I've been covering since. 2021 at this point and uh just finishing up the 70s as of this recording going chronologically so 80s here we come yeah you've had some great guests on i Did have you... including well, one I was gonna... ryan mcquade i was gonna say <laughs> oh i was gonna ask who's been your favorite guest so far but you know clearly dang it's it's not me it's somebody else um you really sunk no. that low huh <laughs> <laughs> scrape no, you, the bottom of the barrel if you're not already listening to it you should really listen to kevin's podcast it's it's truly it's one of my favorite listens every week and um i, I commend you for being so detailed your guests are always amazing and uh just your dedication my friend it's it's truly one of the best listens i i, I don't say that unless i truly mean it and uh so just well, i appreciate your dedication as well and jay of course well, oh and and jay yeah yeah <laughs> boom listen this was my first time chatting and it was it was a pleasure so <laughs> it's all downhill from here is what he's <laughs> saying folks so jay can you tell everybody where we can find you and all your work on the internet sure you can find me at the artist formerly known as twitter at <laughs> mr j ledbetter find me on letterboxd i guess i think it's just j ledbetter on Letterbox. i think so and uh you can listen to this podcast that you're listening to now moving forward. But yeah. Kevin, thank you so much for joining and thank you for thank uh, you. being patient with my technical difficulties to go a little behind the scenes. But I'm used uh, to it with my show. Believe it me. was uh, <laughs> it was it was awesome. It's an awesome conversation. You you yeah. you know definitely brought up some stuff that I never considered with uh, with Carol. So I appreciate it very much. You also made us more professional today, Kevin, because last listen, week, it's we Carol. Were... You have to be like, you know, yeah, yeah. our last episode. Absolutely unhinged. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, what are your thoughts on Akon City? Yeah, real quick. I do not understand the question and I will not <laughs> respond to it. <laughs> I reject your hypothesis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can find me on whatever the bird app is now called. Uh, and also uh, Instagram and Letterbox at Ryan McQuaid 77. You can find my work pretty much 
over when you click on those places, but you can find it here and various other places, but mostly here at Awards Watch. And uh, if you aren't already subscribed, you should go and subscribe to the Awards Watch newsletter. You just go to awardswatch.com, sign up for it. You can get all podcast updates, reviews, festival news. We're getting closer and closer to the festival season, so you might want to uh, get signed up for that newsletter so then you can read everything, all of our amazing staff's work. And Eric puts those things together, so he would really appreciate that. And uh, no, he's uh, not paying me to tell you that. Um, I'm doing it out of uh, the the kindness of my heart, but also uh, a little bit contractually obligated as well. Next week's show, we are going to be talking about Todd Haynes's next film in our series, which is Wonderstruck. And I'm looking forward to talking with Jay and another guest next week about Based on the, the ACDC song. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for listening and we will see you all next time.